There you go. Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't start start uh, with your introductions and, and let's do it. All right. We'll get right into it, everybody. Uh, welcome back. I think I am your last session for the afternoon between That's me, party. Yeah, me, me and cocktail hour. So uh, I'll, I'll try to get through the information and keep it as engaging as possible. I'm Dan Shapiro. I am the founder of ClickCloud. My company is a cloud service aggregator. Uh, we're a digital marketing agency. We do turnkey websites, blogging, email marketing, website analytics for our, our clients. My client base is predominantly IT service providers. If I can, just for the, the groups, for, for the group out here, and I'll, I know you can't uh, out there on the, on the web, web portion answer, maybe you can through polling, but just in the, in the group today, how many of you um, are CompTIA members, Computing Technology Industry Association? Got a couple members. Uh, how many of you out there might have heard of CompTIA before? CompTIA? Seems like about 80%, so I'll keep it brief for the 20% the that are out there. I'm a member of, the, of CompTIA, so uh, I am on faculty with CompTIA. They just tagged me to come speak at various conferences. The Computing Technology Industry Association is the trade association for the channel. So if you're a, uh, a software publisher like Microsoft who sells through the channel, or you're a, a, a organization that sells IT services to small businesses, uh, CompTIA is your trade association. And through that, that means you get channel education, there's research that's specifically geared towards uh, the IT service channel. Uh, there's also uh, advocacy when it comes to uh, your, your rights and what happens in Washington, D.C. and how it can impact you uh, in your business on back, back wherever you happen to, happen to be. So know that this, this educational session today is brought to you by CompTIA. And, uh, like all the training from CompTIA, it really comes out of the community. So for this specific training, we're talking about accelerating your business in the cloud. There's a cloud community that uh, is a couple hundred members strong, so it seems. I, I remember going to my first cloud community meeting, seeing maybe, uh, I don't know, they have six, six, peop six service providers and six vendors all trying to figure out how we're going to make money at it. Last meeting I attended, there's probably over 150 uh, attendees, and that was at the annual member meeting that was in Chicago in March. So uh, as you pointed out, most of you are familiar with CompTIA, which is great. Okay, so what we're going to go over in the next hour, and we're right at, right at starting point, so I'm ready, ready to go with a minute in it. We're going to uh, talk about defining uh, the, your business model, try to talk and demystify the different ways you can make money, basically, in, cloud, in, in the cloud uh, services area. And then we'll talk about how you, can, uh, how you can take that business framework and apply it to your own business. First, in how you carve out your own value proposition. So we're going to take what could be a, a full day's worth of training and cram it into the better part of an hour and talk about different ways that you can, you can round out your messaging when it comes to, to cloud, and then talk about some internal issues on your staff, on what you may need to do to either train your staff uh, or retool your organization to take advantage of, of, of the uh, cloud opportunity. And then also to position yourself from a business standpoint. I know I hear trusted advisor thrown around a lot, and some people don't care for the term. Some people embrace the term. Whether you look at it one way or another, is this is not a, we're not talking about the technical aspects, we're talking about the business aspects today and how you can position yourself as a business person. So when you're going into that owner of a company, as you're probably the owner of your own organization, you can speak, speak in their own language, in their language uh, uh, eye to eye. All right, so this, the charts label cloud business models, I like to think of it as the cloud ecosystem. So uh, I mentioned, for example, I'm a cloud aggr aggregator. I almost said cloud aggravator. Uh, there's a, I, I see some, at least somebody out there is pay, paying attention. Uh, and, 
I'm guessing that most of you are channel, are channel players. So you're somewhere in the channel. If I could see just by raise of hands, you're out there servicing small to medium businesses yourself. And are there any technology vendors or, uh, in, in the room today, anybody who provides cloud solution? We've got one. So got, got a couple, one, another one up front. Uh, does anybody does anybody publish a software as a service? Software as a service vendors none none here today. Okay, so uh, all all areas of the ecosystem you're probably familiar with already, and it's just good from a framework standpoint. Uh, we're going to talk about you as a channel player, and then how you interact with your end users. I was uh, in a recent cloud cafe. Uh, event, it was part of our community and it was uh, early in the morning, uh, everybody's having a cup of coffee on the cloud community and a, a debate broke out about how can you make money in the cloud. By the way, for those of you in the room, there should be some sign up sheets that are going around, so hopefully take your time and, and fill them out so we can keep track of who's gone through channel education with CompTIA. And these this debate broke out about how do you make money in the cloud? And there's somebody who said, you know, I would never think of building my own infrastructure. I would just rely on public cloud and I resell it. I get my transaction fees and I get my monthly recurring revenue and I would never ever waste my time. And then somebody build, building out any infrastructure and somebody else heated debate broke out and they were saying, well, I, I had my own infrastructure. I was part of my business. I know how to build data centers. It's what I do for a living, and I'm good at it, and I've been applying that to cloud, and I make good money, and this is a windfall for me. And there, this debate's going back and forth. They're both right. There's plenty of ways to make money in, in the cloud. So this part of the discussion, while I talk about these different business models, I'd like you all in the audience to kind of reflect on your own businesses and say, which one sounds like me? I'm going to pull you in a moment and ask you to tell me what group you might think you're going to fall, you might fall into. Uh, the first one is a cloud designer and builder. So this is, this is somebody who has good systems integration skills. So they've, uh, in, their, in their background, maybe they've done data center build outs, as I mentioned. In their background, maybe they've, uh, uh, work with APIs, maybe they're really good at uh, getting two different applications to work, work together. The second, uh, th this comes in handy if you've got a client, for example, who, who needs a private cloud solution or maybe they're going to be a, have a hybrid model. So maybe they have some legacy applications that are still on premise, but they want to use some public cloud services that are out there and they need you to come in and knit it all together for them. Then very popular model, the one in the middle, the cloud services reseller. I have to admit when I give these trainings and I ask, I see this more probably than, than the other areas of bus, uh, from a business model standpoint. These are organizations that focus on reselling others cloud services. So. They might include online backup or remote backup as part of their managed service offering. Maybe they're reselling desktop as a service, hosted exchange. Maybe they have a specialty in CRM for software as a service application. And then the third, third category that at least the communities have defined and CompTIA has defined, and there's probably other categories that are out there, but to get through the next re remaining 50 minutes of our presentation, know that uh, we're going to talk about three different models. This is cloud service provider. Somebody actually operates the data center and provides that public cloud service to their clients. So as I describe these, how many of you see yourself as maybe a builder out there? I'm going to build my own cloud services. Anybody fall into that category? I was going to say there's usually one or two in the room. Yeah. Then how many of you see yourself building a cloud service, the one on the far right, building a cloud service and you just, I think somebody already raised their hands earlier. There's a couple gentlemen I know at least said that you are cloud providers. So anybody else besides those two? And then how many of you, um, let me ask the question two different ways. How many of you are currently reselling someone else's cloud services? And so that's a very small percentage of you. And then 
How many of you are uh, considering reselling? So I'm up to about half now. And the rest of you either aren't paying attention or you're in the wrong room, right? So, uh, so for the audience out there on the webinar, about it seems like about 80% of the group here in Redmond today is considering uh, reselling some type of cloud service. So let me ask you another question. This is a, a different question, but how many of you out there believe that your clients probably have already adopted or are using some sort of cloud technology already? And the rest of you think that your clients aren't using any kind of cloud sharing, they're not using any kind of uh, 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 online backup or remote backup or other kind of storage that they might get from either their, their uh, mobile provider, their, uh, their phone company, or some cloud service they might have subscribed to online, maybe a software as a service like a salesforce.com or other CRM, no? So if you didn't raise your hand, then you probably don't know, because the truth is your clients probably have already made decisions and they're already out there using cloud technologies, whether you've recommended them or not. So uh, all right, so those are the models that, that we're going to talk about. Now, I'll, I'll tap through this one quickly, because there are only a couple people uh, who raise their hands when you're choosing your model. Uh, by the way, there's a handout that you will get, this quick start guide at the end of the session, which is a, a primer and a good review tool. So everything I'm telling you today is included in the guide. Uh, and it's something that after the session, if you read it, you'll get a lot more out of it. But one of the first steps is to figure out how you're going to make money at this and figure out the metrics. How, what's my yardstick? What am I going to use to determine whether I'm successful or not at the end of the day? So if you're, if you're a cloud, designer and builder, and you have a, a cloud service that you offer, you want to track what percentage of your projects are including that billable service, and hopefully you're attaching that service to 100% of all of your, your projects, and that you have a target percentage of revenue overall from your company that you hope to get uh, from your cloud services, and that you've taken that and converted it into specific sales goals and doled that out to your sales team and that you also track your margins so that you can keep track of am I, am I making the money that I thought I was going to make on cloud services. Now the, the metrics are a little bit different when you start looking at becoming a cloud reseller. You're going to track a, a different type of a dashboard. Now let me ask another question for those of you out there in the room. How many of you sell some type of managed service? Managed service providers out there? And that's, I'm going to say for the, the group on the web, web portion, that was most, mostly everybody said they sell some type of managed service. And I'll tell you where uh, managed services was maybe back in 2004, 2006, maybe 2007 timeframe where it's starting to warm up and everybody realizes we got to jump on this. It's kind of where we are with the cloud phenomenon today where a couple of years ago people were just saying, I'm not going to do it until I figure out how I'm going to make money. Now everybody's trying to, f trying to figure out how they can uh, jump on it without missing out. OK, so why I asked you if you're a managed service provider is that if you're a cloud reseller, a lot you're already one step in the right direction because you understand the importance and the value of monthly recurring revenue to your business. So the fact that you've already figured, figured out how to sell a service contract and sell repeatable, deliver on the service and keep those clients helps you greatly when you migrate to, to the cloud. So for those that don't have that in their backgrounds, they're at a disadvantage. For all of you in the room today, that's an advantage that you can capitalize on. First off, when it comes to uh, just tracking recurring revenue growth as a managed service provider, as a cloud service provider or a cloud service reseller, that concept of recurring revenue, important to you, that's something you're going to want to, want to track. What percentage, just like you do with managed services, what percentage of my clients do I have on that cloud contract, monthly recurring revenue coming in the door? You're going to need to track a whole different set of lead generation metrics. Because the, the truth is, when you look at the research on the cloud phenomenon, you will find out that where you used to sell hardware, software licenses, bandwidth, infrastructure, implementation services, all those extra services that you might have built for or sold up front 
kind of go away. They don't go away, but you get paid over time for delivering those services. So when you start looking at your lead gen model, it's kind of uh, like the, like they, yeah, you know, it just takes more of them to fill you up. So you're gonna have to have a bigger pipeline uh, and a shorter sales cycle in order to get those cloud customers on board. When you do though, because of that recurring revenue model, you'll make better, better margins in the long run off your business. And that's what all the research ind indicates. So you're gonna to wanna to take a look at that and see are you growing your customers? You're gonna to wanna to rework how you forecast your customer churn. So like a managed service provider, your, your uh, customer retention rate is keenly important in being a cloud reseller today. So my rule of thumb, I've, I've launched a couple of software as a service practices in, in my career. I, uh, I built the, the Kaseya software as a service model. So that was mo one of my more recent, more recent product launches. Also uh, going back, it's now Microsoft Maps. It used to be uh, Vicinity. We had a recurring revenue model on that as well. Software as a service, software as a service play, and then a product called Hitslink, uh, which is a website analytics tool. And with all of those, the key was customer retention. It's one thing to go out and sell them, but you want to track your retention rates on the back end and make sure that I always targeted at least 80% retention with my customers because it does, does take a lot to, to sell them, but it, uh, it's a lot harder to go get a new customer than it is to keep one that you've already got. So keep that in mind. And then also uh, just taking a look at really the overall life expectancy of your customer. So that's another metric. So if you're looking at signing a customer, can you hope that you're gonna get them for three years on board? Uh, and then looking at the total contract value, not just that first month sale or the, or the initial contract value like you might have done in a traditional software resale type of a model. So your cost of customer acquisition also becomes keenly important. So you want to make sure that you can efficiently onboard your customers, efficiently acquire new customers and get them through your pipeline, get them through the funnel. Customer satisfaction directly linked to your customer churn and then your rates of new customer acquisitions. I like to call that my conversion rate. So when I look at how many leads does it take to get me a customer, that's my conversion rate on the back end. Again, in, a, in the one day, full day class of this where we do a, the cloud intermediate session, we'll spend a lot more time on all of these. So that's a little bit about the operation. So a couple different models. What I heard from all of you out there today is that uh, that reseller model seems like it's the one that comes closest to you if you're in the managed service business. As I said, when you take a look at the metrics that you're using to track your managed service business, you should be able to apply those numbers directly uh, from a success ratio standpoint to the cloud services model. All right, moving on to topic two. So this is crafting your message and, and your positioning. And I like, I like the way this starts out because we're starting off, it's called the direct sales model. And what that means is not maybe direct where you think of a direct versus channel sale, but think of it more like my customer, I guess it's the same, my customer goes out and buys direct. So they find some kind of a tool or technology that they don't need me to go buy. Can any, a, anybody think of something like that where somebody bought something from some cloud app that uh, maybe they bought something, signed up online, didn't need an IT person, sample from the crowd out there today just testing you? Carbonite, yeah, so Carbonite was the, the answer. And that's usually the one that comes up the most when you're looking at it direct, is some kind of, I like to call them cloud sharing. Some people call it file backup or data backup, right? But they're, it's the value prop is, how do I get the data off of my PC somewhere into the cloud so that I could have access to it uh, just in case or access to it from multiple devices, right? And that's something that's very common that your customers might have, that's why when I asked that loaded question, how many of you think your customers are using the cloud and half of you didn't raise your hands, well, I guarantee you, I will, I'll put money on that one, that your customers have downloaded some kind of a app like that or subscribed to some kind of a service like that and they've gone direct. They didn't buy it from you, but that's okay because it was, it's a standard app, it's simple, it's 
got limited capabilities. It's not, it's maybe a point solution. There's probably limited integration. Now, chances are somebody's not gonna take that vendor solution that this gentleman mentioned and use that as their business continuity and disaster recovery plan. That's not, that's not really what they bought it for, but for a simple file sharing, hey, it works out okay. So keep that in mind. There is that, there is that time when somebody's gonna go buy something from the cloud and you may not be involved. Now, when you start looking at that indirect or going through the channel model, this is where solutions can get a little bit more complicated. Uh, there may be some integration required. Uh, there may be some business or uh, it could be some compliance related issues that come up where, where there really is some need and is some value from from you as, as a service provider. It could come in the form of training. It could come in the form of implementation. It could come in the form of vendor management. So there's a, a lot of different reasons why your customers could come, come to you. So we had a couple of people who raised their hands that said they sell cloud solutions. If somebody could maybe share one where They've, they're carving out a niche in their market where they're able to actually uh, sell through this indirect model. So they're, in, they're the, they're, they're the go-to person for the cloud solution for their clients. Somebody want to share one? What you might be selling? Gentleman in the front. We just had uh, a client that was uh, running a uh, SBS server 2003. Let me get this over here okay. so that people right. yeah, yeah, yeah. online can hear. Thank you very much. Kind of the traditional story, a uh, client was uh, running server 2000, SBS 2003, yes. time to update the hardware. Uh, the firewall was uh, getting old, everything was getting old, and, and okay, uh, is he going to buy a new piece of hardware to put on site with all of that stuff? Right. Is he going to farm part of it out to uh, hosted exchange? Uh, and uh, in this particular case, we talked about it, and we ended up putting him... Uh, his server in the cloud and full VDI. There you go. So he's got, he now has uh, access to all of his stuff from home on his iPad or uh, at work on uh, uh, either uh, full blown PCs or some Atom PCs. We don't oh, have any thin clients. A little more complicated than downloading a file sharing app, right? Yeah. So there's a great example of. Uh, where you can create value. Your client uh, more than likely came to you for advice and the recommendation in the first place. You probably did uh, some homework for them, made the recommendation, and then not only build them for the implementation, but for the license fees as well. And there's some recurring revenue on the back end. And, I'm, and for those out on the webcam, the head's nodding the whole way. So. Uh, there's, there, are, there are models that are out there, and you may listen to that, and you may say, say to yourself, that doesn't sound a whole lot different than what I've been doing for my whole career. I've, uh, whether it was software selection and software implementation, the only difference is maybe it could be how the money changes hands or when the money comes in the door, uh, and we'll talk about that as I round out the discussion when it comes to how you carve out your value proposition uh, in selling to your customers. All right, so as you said, there was process change, or in that case, it was somebody with antiquated hardware and they didn't want to make the, the investment, so it sounds like they used a lot of what they already had, uh, and they had, had uh, more of a robust solution that they required, and it required an indirect sales model. So you provide advice, possibly management, maybe some integration, maybe some customization all along the way. All right, so with that as a framework and you're thinking about what you've traditionally sold and now you're bringing that to the cloud, uh, think about all the steps across the way that, that you could be adding value to your clients. Now when we teach this class as a as the cloud intermediate class, we'll go through uh, three different case studies. And the case study for the reseller, the reseller wound up selling a, if I remember correctly, it was a business continuity service. They wound up focusing on an industry vertical. They wound up developing their own training assets that went along with it for their client. Uh, there was some implementation integration services that went along with it. And that's, that's, they hired some outside expertise with people who had contacts. So when it came to 
advice, making the recommendations up front, or actually delivering or, or provisioning the apps, uh, skipped over planning and designing, thinking through how we're going to do it, the actual provisioning, the implementation, the training, the management and operations, monitoring it, making sure it was up and running, providing support for the end users, overall management product, project management, vendor management. There was value that you created or value that you can create all along the way. So as you start looking at developing your own message around the cloud, it's not just I want to sell you the cloud or a basic story about cloud is, cloud is good or a better way to go. You want to think through, ask yourself these questions, where can I add value to my clients from my own business? Now obviously with a room this size, we can't break up into a workshop and roll up our sleeves uh, to go through all of this on our own. So this is something, it's, I guess it'll be your homework assignment. All right, so some examples all along the way. Spent, let's spend a little time on this if we, if we can. So let's just start about uh, ad advising. So use an example, it could be requirements definition. So you're gonna go off and, and do the surveys, ask your clients what do they really need to accomplish, what are their business objectives. Maybe the solution could be cloud-based backup and recovery, or it could be an integrated solution. Maybe it's that hosted exchange and we've got some additional backup for compliance reasons that we knitted in along with it. Uh, and the surface example. So you're not selling cloud, you're selling, you're positioning yourself as a data loss or doing risk analysis, right? So that's, that's your lead in. So I'm not out there saying, hey, I'm a cloud provider. I'm out there helping you with your, your security or your, your business continuity services or your business continuity needs. I specialize in that area. All right, so we've got another, when it comes to design, and this is just a, a completely different scenario. So up front now, maybe instead of a requirements definition, maybe I'm doing a functional specification for something I'm gonna build or something I'm gonna architect, or something that you know, we have a, a more detailed set of requirements that we need to comply with. Uh, and the solution, in this case, it's a private cloud archive scenario. Uh, why? Because in this case, it was a healthcare solution and they had some patient data that needed to be secured and it was a storage moder modernization project. So it's a different way of positioning it. You can see the common thread here is the word cloud uh, rarely shows up in the bottom line. Okay, implementation services. So uh, your value add is accelerating deployment because this is what you know how to do. The customer wanted a SaaS-based CRM and maybe you just happen to have the expertise on how to integrate, knit together those various solutions. So you have a software customization or cloud integration service. Or maybe you sell a turnkey bundle. Maybe you position yourself as an aggregator in the market and you've got your either own white label CRM that you sell or you've got a service that you wrap around that turnkeys the implementation for your clients. Management, so you monitor, monitoring is your value added. You wanna make sure that your cloud provider stays in compliance. So that's it's great, you're in the cloud, that doesn't mean you're not gonna have any challenges. So we do that for our clients. We, mo we monitor websites, just part of what we do because we've got an infrastructure provider that we gotta keep honest and we wanna make sure they meet their SLA. So we put some monitoring out there to make sure that they do. In this case, it might be managing email uh, and uh, it could be compliance review. I wanna make sure that, that from a monitoring and reporting standpoint that your vendor, this cloud services vendor, is doing what they said they were gonna do for you, for my client. So you're advocating the client, you take that pain away for them, from them. So all different ways of positioning yourself. And the last one, so support or support and maintenance and maybe you're the single throat to choke as they like to say, right? So you're the person that they call because they don't want to call a bunch of different vendors and uh, you're selling a vendor support or a contract audit. Again, uh, managing the vendors, taking some pain points away from your customers. So these are f from your customers' day-to-day -day hassles. So these are all ways that you can differentiate yourself across the cloud. Does anybody in the, in the audience have a, something they'd like to share on that, a way that maybe they differentiate themselves with their cloud solution? 
I know we only, it seemed like the minority actually selling in the cloud today. So, and I know it's late on a Friday afternoon, so uh, I'll have to come up with some livelier questions. All right, a couple other factors, and I guess I'm gonna just take a moment and I'm gonna stump for this time tomorrow. I'll be here in the same position between you and cocktail hour talking about verticals. We're gonna spend a whole hour on busting out how to go after verticals. And I'm not gonna stand, by the way, I'm not gonna stand up here and tell you what's the best vertical to go after, or why one vertical is better than another, or why one vertical is harder to get into than another, but just more, it's a, a really constructive process to go through to say, if I'm going through a vertical, you're gonna pick up a couple tips and tricks along the way for how to tackle any given vertical. So you may have a vertical focus. This is just by way of example, not recommending the vertical, but it could be healthcare. I think the, the case study in the intermediate session, as I mentioned before, was oil and gas. And so by specializing, not in cloud, but specializing in a specific vertical that happens to tap cloud technology, again, you're focusing on the business solution, you're selling medical Im imaging or cloud so security, or maybe it's HIPAA compliance, or maybe you build mobile apps that are cloud-based for that specific healthcare I industry. And uh, th these are, th this is not winging it on the solutions. This is uh, when you do the research of IT buyers in the healthcare space, and you look at whether it's hospitals, physician groups, dental, chiropractic, et cetera, these are the kind of the top go-to things that the IT spend uh, uh, when it comes to small to medium size organizations in that particular vertical, if you happen to read the research. And but just again, a little commercial for CompTIA, they publish that kind of research for you. All right, application focus is also another area that you can specialize in. So whether it's uh, selling exchange, as, as we heard up front, or maybe it's desktop as a service applications, some other kind of a software as a service, it might be CRM applications, email. I hear a lot about uh, uh, unified communications that are cloud-based, it seems to be popular. I hear more and more of that popping up in the channel, whether it's some kind of uh, hosted PBX type of func functionality or uh, voice over IP type of solutions that are cloud-based. Cloud backup and disaster recovery. And I'm actually surprised, and I'll, I'm gonna ask that question again. Since so many of you raise your hands, I'm just gonna make them raise their hands. So uh, no, micro, no microphone required. But for those of you that said you're managed service providers, how many of you provide some kind of offsite or remote backup that goes along with it? So you're already kind of a step in the right direction. That was more people that raised their hands when, they, when I asked earlier saying, do you sell or resell cloud, some type of cloud services? So, uh, and then maybe selling virtual infrastructure. Vir the virtualization, one of the reasons why cloud technology is really even possible today. When I think back, just anecdotally, I had a software as a service company before people called them software as a service, uh, before we knew any better. And uh, th this was the, the company that did the website analytics. My billing model was such that I would, I would collect for every visitor on your website, every page click was, wasn't quite a penny in my pocket, but that was a correlation, right? So from my business standpoint, I was the chief operating officer, I didn't wanna miss a single click. That was really important to me. That was our number one objective, was collect all, all clicks. So we had fairly elaborate data centers. We wanted to be on multiple backbones. If AT&T went down, we wanted to make sure that SBC was still up and we could have failover. And it was, uh, we had this LAMP infrastructure that would, was low cost hardware that could collect all of those hits. And the database servers on the back end were a more traditional client server architecture that we needed to update on a regular basis. And we had these queues that would stay in place. And if a server failed, you know, we'd have to go, we just, we didn't want to lose any of those clicks. And that was just how the architecture worked. So whenever we need to do a hardware upgrade, this was a pretty complex beast. And it was expensive. We would have to either 
find somebody at the data center. We had, we had coverage, we had contractors that we could use and relationships with suppliers. They could actually take our new blades and stuff them in the racks. Open, they had access to our cages and could go in there and service the machines if they needed to. Um, or we would have to do it ourselves, which meant we'd either have to fly or drive to one of the data centers and because uh, they were spread out across the country for, for lots of different reasons because we're super paranoid and uh, do it ourselves. Now, running my own business, I can use an infrastructure, uh, a cloud-based infrastructure supplier. If I outgrow my platform with a phone call, I can go from a shared service to a dedicated service, from a dedicated service to a secure dedicated service. I can upgrade myself from a virtual environment to a dedicated environment with a phone call. And usually the, the price point of doing that with a cloud provider, it's, you know, it's 60 bucks. It's 100 bucks, 150 bucks, 150 bucks a month. Where before it was really, really expensive. That could have been the least payment on just one of the servers alone. So um, back to the application focus. I know I went a little four wheeling there because I, I like to do that uh, in our in our sessions. Is kind of cite some real life examples that you could uh, bring into your own business. But the power of the cloud now, and you can tell I'm a cloud evangelist, is that. I don't have to be on the hook for that anymore. And I can share those resources of those skills that are out there at somebody else's burden. I don't have to maintain, I don't have to worry about my cage in that data center and do I have to have access to it where I know that there's a team of people and there's a knock in place and somebody else is going to deal with that. And for many of you who raise your hands as the, the reseller model kind of fits where you're at in your own business, I think you, you get all of that. That's a good thing. Yeah, just a quick note here Yes, from David. Uh, David just wants to make sure that Harry and Aaron from Varvid know that the online production is excellent. Good sound and great camera switching. Slides are easy to see. Thank you. That's great, David. Thanks for the comments and the feedback. That's awesome to hear. I just we want know to keep them engaged so they know yeah, that yeah, we, yeah. we hear them. Yeah, do we know where David's coming from? He'll tell us. San Diego. San Diego. David, I, I left Laguna Beach, flew all the way here to Seattle, so you could watch me on a screen when you would have been maybe uh, 30, 40 minutes from my home. Good to meet you, David. All right. So that was a little bit on the messaging and uh, just in re recapping. You could look at verticals. You could look at point solutions. The, the major takeaway I like to reinforce uh, overall, when you're looking at developing your own message is don't focus on the technology, focus on, on, the, on the solution set, focus on the business issues, uh, because that's what your customers are going to buy from you at the end of the day. It's, it's your expertise. Okay. So uh, moving on. All right. So now let's take a look at your own business and ask yourself, what does this mean internally to my, my own organization? Now, I, I, I'll share with you some anecdotal notes on how I might have either restructured my organization or having the liberty to build a, a company, cloud-based company from scratch. You know, how I looked at it from everything I've heard from all the training and the classes, and then maybe some of you can also share some of your own feedback on, on uh, how, how you've structured your organizations. So first, looking at your engineers, maybe in a couple different ways. There are those engineers that operate the cloud business, and then there are those engineers that maybe interface with your customers, and it's good if particularly if you're the cloud uh, provider, you want to separate those responsibilities. Now, if you are a cloud reseller and you're just a pure reseller, you may just have the strategic engineers because you're not worried about the operational engineers. However, if you're doing some integration work, uh, even me as an aggregator, so on my platform, we're always, always bringing on new technologies, even though it may be um, a third party that I'm integrating them with an API 
or it might be a new service that we're subscribing to. There's always some technical details and making sure, first of all, vetting the suppliers, making sure we find the best one, making sure they're compatible with one another, making sure we know the ins and outs, and making sure we know how to use it, and then making sure that things stay up and running. Uh, making sure that all, all of our platform at the same time is always on the current version of what, whatever the cloud solutions are that we operate. So when you're, and you'll read this in the takeaway, the difference between your operational engineers, again, they're feeding the machine, whereas your strategic engineers and perhaps consultants are out in, in front of the clients on a regular basis. Uh, structuring a pre-sales team. So you, you may dedicate resources to pre-sales. Now, in the cloud model, some clients I've seen actually can monetize their pre-sales activity. Sometimes they give it away. So uh, a typical uh, area of engagement that I, I've seen with my client base would be some kind of an on-site assessment or cloud assessment. So they want to get the on-site appointment. So they'll offer that. Uh, there may be a white paper or a blog article or a newsletter article that talks to issues about either understanding the cloud or how do I know if I need a private cloud or a public cloud or what's this thing called a hybrid cloud? Uh, is my organization ready for the cloud? What do I need to ready, do to migrate myself to the cloud? These are all little nuggets, little bait on the hook that you could use to engage, actively engage with the client for your pre-sales people to get out in front of your customers. Now when you say cloud assessment, what's a cloud assessment? Well, gentleman in the front row talked about a company with antiquated hard hardware, architecture. I'm guessing that they had, maybe they had good existing bandwidth or maybe there might have been a network upgrade that was required. One or the other, right? In that case, you nodded they had good bandwidth. So a lot of times companies say, we're moving to the cr cloud, that's the edict, but the network's not robust enough. Because now all of a sudden, instead of just tapping that premise-based server, they need to have a pipe that goes out to, it may not be, it might not be a high bandwidth, but it needs to be consistent and reliable. Because if their network's not reliable, if they don't have good solid connectivity, then they're going to have a loss of productivity when it comes to their client, when it comes to their uh, usage of their cl new cloud solution. So your pre-sales people could monetize that. Maybe that's a service that you charge for. We're going to come out and do a cloud assessment, make sure that you've, that, uh, you've got what it takes. One that I heard, this is, this is kind of baffling. Uh, this came up, I think it was probably about a year ago, and I was uh, teaching a session on cloud technologies. And I, if I remember, it was in Los Angeles, where you would think, you know, it's a big city, everything's pretty wired, but they were, I don't think, I live in Orange County, so we're like the land of the tilt up. So most of the buildings in Orange County are, are two to three stories tall, kind of like a campus environment of what you see around here. So these guys sell downtown Los Angeles, and in LA, we've got some skyscrapers, tall buildings, and they said the top, and some of their clients in the top floor just didn't have broadband like they needed in order to implement cloud solutions, and blew me away. I'd never heard that before. I never even thought about it. I don't sell in that market, but they'll go into an older office complex. It's just not wired, and there's just no way to get it up there, and I, there's probably some, I'm more of the business guy. There's probably some engineers out there that can tell me the theoretical, theoretical limitation or running it you know, all across copper and all of that, but I guess that's a big limitation. So know that there's money to be made when you're going out there with your clients, or at least it's a good opportunity for you to engage with, with your prospects through pre-sales. And then vendor management. So never underestimate the importance of you being uh, investing in somebody in your organization, or at least tagging somebody in your organization if you're not large enough yet, to the consideration for uh, keeping tabs on on vendors. Now, there's something that's missing from here. I didn't. I don't. I don't build the charts. I just get to talk to them and all of that. But this is just along the way that I, I like to encourage and stress is account management. So I think account management is also a very important piece, particularly when you're looking at, uh, at solutions that you're selling where you're not collecting all that cash up front and your cash is coming in over time. 
So uh, the man of service providers in the room kind of know this, that you want to make sure that you retain those, those clients and you can do it through account management. Now your account managers are people that can handle, they're like the Swiss Army knife. They can handle just about anything. They may not be the most technical. Maybe they don't work in accounting. Maybe they're not in the sales organization, but trust me, they're salespeople. They're out there dialoguing with their clients on a regular basis, making sure that they feel love. They feel the love from your organization. And if there's ever a problem, there's somebody that they know that they can go to and get that problem solved. Having solid account management in place can help you improve your margins. Let me tell you how. Uh, rather than having your most expensive engineer on the phone all the time with that client, maybe solving, maybe listening to the what's the problem with the bill this month and I don't understand why to uh, everything from I thought I put that ticket in, I thought it was open, I didn't know the ticket got closed, let, let me walk you through how to, how to open up your tickets and how to, how, to, uh, how to get your tickets closed or status a ticket or an issue. Account managers are, are golden in that, in that regard. And like I said, they'll improve your margins because you don't have to have your expensive employees doing those, those types of tasks. The other thing they'll do is they'll help you with your retention rate. So I believe there's a direct correlation to having solid account management in your organization and customer retention. And if, you're, if you believe what I said a few slides ago when it came to uh, retention rates, as particularly in a reseller model that most of you raise your hands, that if you want to retain those customers, cons consider structuring your organization somehow to have some kind of uh, constant touch to your customers when it comes to account management. How many of you have some kind of dedicated account management in your organization today? Is that one person? I'm going to. Now, if you only, you're, yeah, if you only have one person, it's hard to de dedicate. I know, I know. We're we're pretty small too, but we we have a dedicated account manager, so it's important. Okay. Another thing you need to factor in, aside from just those roles or job descriptions that may fit into your co company, is uh, is the educational aspect, or maybe it's talent or skill set. It could be things that you can learn in the classroom, you know, technically. And I would I'm going to guess, and I just never never stumped me so far, but usually it's not the technology that's the issue. So this is a pretty tech savvy industry. People have been around long enough. They know their way in and out of, uh, of networking. They know their way in and out of, uh, of solid backup planning, et cetera, and how to make the software work, how to make the hardware work, and all of that. But the area of understanding the vertical, like I said, we're going to spend a whole hour on it this time tomorrow, and then also the business side of it. And I'm going to spend an, an, uh, a disproportional time on the business side of it, and I want to make sure, I guess this comes up a lot, particularly the topic of capital expense versus operating expense. But uh, let me just touch on the vertical knowledge. So regardless of the vertical, and teaser for tomorrow, Number, this is recent research from CompTIA. Number one reason why somebody buys IT services from a given organization is uh, because of their technical expertise. So I grant that, right? Number two reason, vertical knowledge, industry knowledge. So imp important to, to point that out. I'll bring that up again tomorrow about this time. Uh, Retail, healthcare, education, doesn't matter, hospitality. Understand the products, the lines of business applications. Understand the competition, the other products that maybe you don't resell. Uh, you need to be up on those. The challenges, and when I say challenges, those are the business challenges that your clients, uh, that your clients face. And then how your technology is strategically positioned within the industry. And then also just understanding the industry technology, like at least know how to spell HIPAA. All right. Um, then when it comes to the business side of it, not only being able to go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, and I think that, that many of us in this room, being small business owners ourselves, we operate our own business, so you have to have some kind of financial, uh, financial acumen to begin with. Now, I, I don't want to take it for granted. I'm actually a CPA, so it's a, I'm kind of an accidental CPA, but that's just something in my background, I'm, I'm an, I, am a, I am an accountant. At one time, was counting beans. 
So let's talk a little bit about capital expense versus operating expense. I want to explain to you why it's important, why it's in the, in the background of the minds of your cloud providers. And I think we've got, just from a time check, I think we've got about 10, 12 minutes for everybody in the audience. So I'm going to ask that if you've signed, haven't had a chance to sign in, if you can do so. Now, has everybody signed in? Did, who has not signed in? Okay, and then move those to maybe the center and we'll pick them up. And then there's also some course evaluations, which I think are either out there or being distributed. They're right here on the front table right here. I'm gonna, got them, okay. If you can complete those as well, it keeps me out of hot water. And then just as a, a, a quick reminder, see me directly after, directly, directly, come on up and grab one of these off the table. It reinforces everything I said. So I, I do that just to make sure you all stick around. Although, Harry, you have some technique that keeps, the, this group is glued to their chairs. Is it, is, how do you do it? How do you do it? All right, so capital expense versus operating, operating expense. So, as we all know, you know, the last few years of the financial bubble bursting, it's been really hard for clients to get, your clients to get access to working capital. And, you know, working capital could be just because their businesses are cash flow positive. They got a lot of cash in the bank, meaning they've got some cash that they could invest in, in could used to be hardware and software. Or maybe they had that line of credit, maybe they had those credit cards, maybe they had that second mortgage on their home. However they got that access to cash, that's not there anymore. That's it's easing up a little bit, I see now, but that's not like it was in the go-go days. Things are a lot tighter, a lot more constrained. So what happened in our industry, and we all lived through this, was things came to a screeching halt. I, for it was a while there, I thought I understood what it meant for my parents to have gone through the depression. It's like, I just wanted to take my cash and stick it in a mattress, what, whatever I could hold on to. I wasn't gonna spend anything on, uh, any, any money on anything, and your clients did that same thing. Projects dried up. People were afraid to invest in their business. Then the cloud came along, all this hype about the cloud, and what that, what, there was some magic wand, all of a sudden I could do it in the cloud. Well, because instead of having to buy all your software licenses up front, instead of having to buy that hardware platform up front, or I could no longer get that lease financing, that I used to be able to get because I can't qualify for that anymore. Uh, now they could just think of it like a rental model. I just subscribe, a subscription model, and I'm paying as I go, or I'm paying over time. It was almost like instant financing for, the, for your buyers. So what, what that means from an accounting standpoint, so when you're talking to the business owner that's got an accounting background, that means that they're, they're looking at it from instead of investing in the capital like I own it, I'm investing in a subscription where maybe think of it like I'm renting. Or you know, a simple example would be like a car. Am I going to lease my car or am I going to buy the car? Now, I don't want to get into all the vagaries of an operating lease, that kind of a thing. But when you buy a car, you know at the end of the lease term, that thing is yours. It's yours forever. When you, and that would be what's considered a capital expense. So I'm investing in my business and I'm getting something at the end of it, a piece of capital that a financial person is going to depreciate over time. From an operating expense standpoint, uh, I'm, we have a question from the audience. Yes, we do. Uh, this is from Amori from Brazil. And she says, uh, from a regular SBSer, is there any concrete solid data that compares incomes from the cloud versus traditional IT services provider? There is. Uh, so CompTIA actually has done that research and they have a, they've actually modeled it out. So uh, there are some, some models and without having it in front of me to tell you how it works out, but basically the math on, the math is that uh, you have to sell more. I think it's something about three to five times as many clients. 
but it'll produce something around eight times the extra income in the long run. And I'm kind of paraphrasing. So there is some data that, and if you subscribe to, if you become a CompTIA member, then you can go to the member area and download that research. There's an annual cloud study that comes out. There's also some research and educational content, uh, what's called the cloud fundamental content that has exactly the answers to those questions. Thanks for asking, Amore. Uh, all the way from Brazil. Awesome. Okay, so uh, the operating expense piece is subscription model, right? I'm not paying for the cash uh, up front, so I'm paying as I'm going, or even if I have a service agreement, I know at the end of it, I don't own the assets. So uh, that, that is very attractive to companies, and so that so explaining to your clients that it's not a capital expense, it's coming out of operating expense, is very fashionable these days. Uh, the business owners like that because it helps them manage their cash flows. Uh, also, you just need to understand the basics of your revenue versus profit. Revenue is your top line income coming in, whereas the profits are what you have left over after all of your operating expenses. Uh, and there's even a profit before tax or profits after tax. And then maybe your clients have an annual report. You're trying to kick up the discussion to be more of a financial discussion than a technology discussion. You also need to understand from a business standpoint the workflow through departments, which is highly correlated with your vertical knowledge on the left. And then understanding the, the business value of the cloud. So what, what probably on that, one of the biggest business values, well, we heard about one today. I, I have a client who does this. He's in the wholesale, he's in the wholesale business, he sells to these food distributor companies. He's found this niche because they all have old hardware. And he knows he's not going to be able to sell them new hardware because they, 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 they don't have the access to the capital to go invest in a new network. And he kills it. He goes in there with a the virtual desktop solution. And he can sell them on that subscription model. They get the up-to-date equipment without having to lay out the cash. So he understands that, that value of the cloud. Other value of the cloud. That, some, that is often overlooked. It may not necessarily be cheaper for your clients in the long run to be on the cloud. So they may get three to five years out of that server. Some of them are squeezing more, right? We know that they, they can really wring a, a lot out of uh, those Windows XP machines that are still out there chugging away. You know what I'm talking about. So when they're on that subscription model, it may not be as much cash up front, but uh, it may cost them more in the long run, I mean, if they really penciled it up. But that's not necessarily a downside because they're probably getting more than they would have gotten if they bought it. They could have never afforded that solution on their own. So as a small business owner, by turning to the cloud, I can now get enterprise class infrastructure, access to enterprise class servers, data center bandwidth, security, op, uh, NOC, managing it, all that goes along with that cloud solution where before they probably couldn't even, even afford the software licenses, which they don't have to pay for now. So it's important for you to understand the value of the cloud. Uh, and this all gets to begging the question, are you the senior advisor to your customers? So really, you know, it's that, that statement I made earlier about being the trusted advisor. It's being able to go toe to toe or eye to eye, not being the tech that comes in you know, to go solve, solve the problem or solve it all remotely, but to be able to have a meaningful dialogue from a business perspective with your clients. So this is kind of a, a, a wrap up, a couple of parting thoughts uh, as we get to the 20 past hour and cocktail time and all of that is focus on your unique expertise uh, and driving a preferred business model. I heard a lot of resellers in the room, but uh, remember we're not just selling, selling the cloud, we're selling the business solutions that go along with it. And you gotta figure out, again, how to capture your own value and articulate that to your clients. Make sure you invest in your people and their skills. Like I said, I, I think account management, it could, I also think verticals, I also think, uh, uh, making sure that you have that right complement of strategic versus tactical people in your organization. Also, we didn't get in a lot of depth, but uh, partnerships are also important. Make sure you vet your vendors. 
Uh, closing comment on that is your vendor service, your supplier service level agreement becomes your service level agreement. So make sure that your SLA uh, never exceeds those of your suppliers because you'll be on the hook for the gap. Uh, and then make sure that you provide your team the tools and resources from a sales standpoint. So whether it's a solid collateral, sales aids, PowerPoint presentations, or whether it's uh, social media or, or, uh, or email marketing, et cetera, make sure that, you've, that your message for cloud is integrated in with, uh, with your solution set and what you're offering. And then as we started the conversation, take a look at the plan, come up with the metrics, dedicate yourself to X percent of my revenue next year is gonna be in the cloud. And that's uh, what I have for today. Okay, we have a tweet here from Ken Edwards from uh, Maverick Mesa. He says, spring is sweet, but the lack of sleep from last night is taking a toll. Ken, it's not only spring, it's borderline oh, summer out there. Yeah, it's almost summertime here in Seattle. I'll have to say more often than not when I come to Seattle, this myth about it being rainy and all of that, it's, I know last time I was up here last uh, winter, it was cold yeah. and it was hailing. That's that Jay. Please. Yeah, 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 Jay and I and Harry were at a we, local vendor event yeah, and got hailed on, but uh, this time of, oh, looking at Mount Rainier with the snow on it was with a clear day, amazing. More questions? Yep, questions please. We have time for a few questions and there's Great. the handout up here, so. Oh yeah. One point that I think everybody should uh, know is that recently Tiffany Bova from Gartner, senior uh, research fellow there, made a very interesting observation about cloud solutions and cloud selling. Yes. And some people considered her remarks controversial, but I don't think I did. Uh, she said, you may have to fire your sales staff and get a brand new one because you're going to be looking at different compensation models when you're selling cloud solutions. And it's very difficult to retrain an existing sales force to go with a different comp model than they've been accustomed to, even though that business model is dying. Right. So that, 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 is, a, that is a valid point and a valid concern. So in the, in the cloud model, it's a great point. In the cloud model, when you pay your sales rep, there's a couple different models. Sometimes there's maybe a bounty for bringing the deal in up front. Uh, but if you, and the bounty might be even like first month subscription, I've seen that. Some reps get paid a haircut on the overall uh, revenue stream from the company. It could be first years for six months. It could be evergreen revenue. That's a lot different than the cash that you get when you close that, that, that elephant sized deal, when that big deal comes in and you're selling hardware, software, big integration project, 30% comes in as a deposit and the rest is, is uh, given on delivery, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So not every sales rep may be used to, their lifestyle might not be in line with the cloud compensation models of today. So uh, if they, and that's something you have to look at. And then, you know, to soften the blow from what Tiffany's saying is that salesperson in your organization who may be good at selling those large integration projects still may be out there and be able to bag those big deals and you can keep them going. So sometimes organizations will bring in somebody new to focus on the cloud services. You know, go ahead. Harry, is it okay? We have one more question? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. You're thinking of older things like SBS 2003 and Windows XP things makes me think well, <clears throat> someone might get Office 2013 and then 10 years later they're still using it. Um, I suppose if you're earning a monthly commission you don't really care but um, is there some, it seems like there's, a, there's still the possibility of getting extra money from upgrading software through the cloud. Well, yeah, so that's, you know, you're actually hit on what I would consider to be an interesting part of the value proposition of the cloud, is that it's not uncommon for software as a service supplier, pu publisher, to keep, to make incremental upgrades to all of their, uh, all of their customers over time. So this notion of the big release or the next version of the upgrade, Big 
Yeah, the big release party is it happened over, overnight during our maintenance window, and you get a notification, and everybody's instantly upgraded. Or they're becoming incrementally upgraded. So uh, it is a different paradigm. Instead of selling the software and selling the upgrades, or think of it, it's almost like if you're on maintenance, you always get the upgrades, and you're always going to the next version. And it's very common for the software as a service publisher to provide that included with the subscription. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab at that as well. I did a blog, uh, I'll get in camera, um, I did a blog where, uh, and, and it's been a long day, so it's the basically the mid-size Office 365 offering. We used to call it E whatever, but you know, they revamped it and changed how they label the things. So let's just assume it's E3, okay, the old name, E3 for Office 365. And, and it's um, now $150 a year or $180 a year under the new Office 365 program, the $15 a month. But if you pay annually, you get the two months off. So it's a subscription model. And um, to, to your point, I don't even know if they'll have revision numbers in the future right. because it just happens on a Tuesday night or a Saturday morning. That's right. And, and they kind of add a new Delta feature like reverse spell check or reverse phone number lookup. But you know what I'm saying? And they'll have a lengthy version number for That's right. record keeping, but it'll probably just be called Office. Well, well, here's the point of my blog. Let's go with $150 a year. So if you bought the old-fashioned on-premises Office uh, professional, um, can anyone, is that like $480, the retail SKU or, or something? We'll keep it simple. So $500 for the on-prem Office Pro uh, 2013 SKU. And, and so now what you can say is, okay, we're assuming a useful life for roughly three years for this release, right? Because 150 a year times three is 450. Let's say that's the same as if you bought it. But the difference is, is you don't have that static bit set at one that's time, right? right? You, you have the dynamic subscription where it's updated. So they're kind of assuming about a three, I, I did this. They're, they're assuming about a three year life for the product, but they sell it on a subscription basis. Subscription basis, that's yeah. right. Yeah, so that, that is sort of baked in. So uh, it's just like being on maintenance, but you're always on the current version. Yeah. And that, you know, and from a publisher's standpoint, there's benefits to that as well, because now I always know all my users are always on the latest version, right? From a, from a, a support perspective, I don't have to worry about, did you install this or stomp a DLL? It's, I know what you got because you're using it on my platform, which is certified, so I know it's supposed to work the way that it's supposed to. Yeah. Okay, so I'll tell you what, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, so we have the uh, big party at 7 p.m. So that gives you about 90 minutes to go back and freshen up and go down to the, uh, the workout room at the residence inn and get a little exercise in and then come and party at 7 p.m. Um, and then the Redmond Town Center where the residence inn has a, a variety of restaurants down there. A couple people were talking about Matador, but that's kind of across the street, right? Matador is not really in the center. 